So for the second part of um, this talk on chapter 8 and 12, we're going to define what a pathogen is and some of the more specific interactions. So we're not going to call them parasites, and we're going to talk about them as pathogens. By definition, they cause disease or harm. And disease is just considered an abnormal state or a state that's away from health, right? So there are lots of different types of diseases out there. Not all are infectious, but we're really going to look at the infectious diseases. Our focus. Okay. Um, an infection is really defined as an increase in the number of pathogens. So you are bombarded by pathogens all the time, right? Take a big deep breath. You might have just breathed in some pathogens, you know go touch the doorknob somewhere. You might have just exposed yourself to some pathogens, but they don't always cause disease. And that's one of the interactions we'll talk about this semester. Um, when they start increasing in number, <clears throat> excuse me, you then have an infection. I want again, and I know I'm harping on this concept, but I want to compare a pathogen versus an opportunist. Okay, because remember that an opportunistic infection is usually due to something that we normally fight off that normally does not cause disease. Whoa, I'm really having issues here. Whoops, what did I do? Ah, normally does not cause disease, but it can if you have a decreased, let's see, I'm going to erase some of this. I have a little more room. Oh, I thought that might, here, I know, wait, well, once again, me and my technology. All right, it can cause disease if you have a decrease in your immune system, right? So we've talked about that. When your immune system is weaker, <clears throat> if something gets in to the wrong place, so say you have burns or you have open wounds, and an organism that normally lives on your skin surface gets into the wrong place, they can now become a pathogen when they normally wouldn't. So they're an opportunist. A lot of times these are also related to what we call secondary infections, right? Because your immune system is weak, because the pathogen can get into the wrong place, you can get this secondary infection. And these infections normally, um, or these microbes normally don't cause infections, but they are opportunists in this environment. Table 12.1 in your um, text talks about some of the um, steps required for an infection. So the organism has to get in. Oops, ooh, that was weird. I don't know what happened. Uh, yeah, crazy. Okay, the organism has to get in. It has to spread. So it has to evade your local defenses. So next week we'll be talking about the immune system and how we have these defense mechanisms. The organism has to multiply. 
A has to make more. Like I said, that's when we define an infection is when you have an increase in the numbers. Um, again, evading the host defense. It's this continuous battle. Can you fight this infection before the numbers get too much? And then you have to remember that that pathogen wants to get out and find a new host. And so we'll talk about um, the next lecture will be entry, exit, transmission, spread, and replication. So some really cool strategies that microbes have to get into a new host, make more microbes, and get out. Right? And pathology, I like this. It says it's not strictly necessary, but often occurs. So sometimes microbes have to cause some pathology or damage to tissues to get to where they need to be for nutrients, for a safe place to replicate. But other times, this is just a kind of unfortunate event due to an infection, and you're going to learn that a lot of the damage in the host is due to our immune system responding to this infection. So we're going to talk very generally about some ways that pathogens evade. Um, so the goal here is... Prevent the host from rejecting or destroying rejecting or destroying the pathogen. Okay. So remember we're going to focus on humans in this medical microbiology course. So a couple ways pathogens have worked to evade, and again, remember this is very general, and we'll talk about specifics as we get to specific pathogens. But they will minimally, if at all, stimulate the immune system. So they're going to kind of sneak in. They have ways to evade or hide from the immune system. They have ways to depress or I wouldn't say shut down but decrease the immune system. Really fascinating strategies depending on the microbe. They have ways to mutate I don't know what I'm doing mutate or change well darn it this every once in a while happens to me sorry mutate or change oh, please don't So immune system has to start all over. Okay. And these are some interesting strategies and when we talk about the immune system you'll see that there is a time that it takes for your immune system to recognize and mount a response to a pathogen. And another evasion mechanism is just to replicate fast. Right. If you can't fight them off, outrun them. Okay. So again, very general. We'll talk about more specific examples, and you will be presenting specific examples in your group presentations. I know this is super small, but you have this table 12.2 in your textbook, so take a look at it. It talks about some of the host defense mechanisms and the microbial answers to it and some specific examples and it's kind of interesting. Host defense. Right? So we will talk about our immune system and we will talk about our barriers and um, things like that uh, next week. Host adaptations, really important one. 
is social behavior. Can you avoid coming in contact with that microorganism? So now you see at doctor's offices, the face mask. If you feel sick, if you're coughing, please put one of these on. So we manipulate our environment. We encourage people not to go out when they're sick. Okay. We've had improvements in food water processing and most of us don't think about that um, here but in less developed countries definitely a huge issue. You can be exposed to a pathogen just because you need to drink some water. So along that comes filtration. Right. We've changed our hygiene, and I never spell this word right. I know there's an extra E in there somewhere. Nee, 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 nee. Okay. Um, wash our hands. Right? You don't even have to use antibacterial soap. In fact, they've been taking that off the market because they found it was making things worse. Just physically washing your hands helps you um, change your uh, behaviors in order to avoid microbes and education. Okay. We've decreased the spread of HIV in this country because we've been able to educate people on how it's transmitted. STDs, another one. The guinea worm is actually a huge economic burden that um, President Jimmy Carter has worked very hard to eradicate. And there was no good medicines or vaccines, but they changed people's behavior. And part of the issue with the guinea worm was that it itches, it, it, it infects subcutaneously and it itches. And so people would go into the water and scratch and itch. And when you break the skin, the guinea worm can get out and it can go infect the next person. So just by changing social behavior through education, if we didn't know how it was transmitted, we couldn't help those people. Great adaptations for us to avoid coming in contact with those pathogens, right? We've also developed vaccines, and we'll talk about vaccines. These are preventative. Well, that's not good. Preventative. It looks like an F, but it's really a T. Preventative. Okay, beautiful. Um, we have drugs and medications as treatment. But what's also interesting I don't know if I can do this because my thing doesn't seem to want to work anymore. Um, is that uh -huh. we have actually helped pathogens? So I would say this is maybe a negative host adaptation to dealing with it world travel. Okay. When would we ever get Ebola in the United States except through world travel? People going to other countries, people coming back. Um, the spread of the flus, the spread of SARS, um, some of the other coronaviruses that people have been very worried about. We travel. We are exposed to lots of different environments and can bring back those bugs with us. Antibiotic resistance. People overuse antibiotics. And we are going to read a paper about syphilis. And because of the high use of antibiotics in countries like China, where you can just go buy it without a prescription, there is a single mutation that has made syphilis very, very resistant to antibiotics. Okay. So we really need to rein this in. And the other thing 
is immunosuppressive therapy. Okay, when you start messing with your immune system, you are helping those pathogens be able to make an opportunistic infection. This next slide I think is really cool because it diagrams or it illustrates um, the response gradient. And the response gradient means that it's just the tip of the iceberg of what we actually see. So who knows what you are infected with right now and I'm infected with or at least exposed to. My body is working hard to fight it off, right? We don't all respond the same. There are variations in symptoms and really the disease has to be diagnosed. We don't always diagnose the disease or we don't always diagnose it correctly. Hopefully we can di diagnose viral versus bacterial and not give antibiotics to people that are have a virus infection and not a bacterial infection, but until you know for sure, you just guess what the medication is. The other part right here is that we respond differently because of our genetics and our nutrition levels, right, and our environment that we live in. Some people seem to fight colds really easily and some people get sick all the time. And that's just this big picture of how different and how challenging it is to understand and stop pathogenic infections. Um, so where we're going next is the steps to infection. And that was actually um, kind of in a previous slide. So we have entry, exit, but really the spread and the multiplication. Okay. Evasion of the host defense. So all of that, um, what was it, figure 12-1. Take a look at that and we will go there next. Thanks.